Welcome to Leicester, where an unknown gem has been overshadowed for nearly a century. Nestled in the heart of Highfields, St. Peter's Church still holds the key to much of the heritage and preserved history of the city, and still exists as a milestone in astonishing architecture, and to the relation in which it bears the close-knit and diverse community within which it lies. Built in 1874, St. Peter's has lived through two world wars and, in particular, seen the exhilarating arrival of the Afro-Caribbean community arrive in Leicester during the 1960s. As decades have passed, St. Peter's has nearly become lost in the changing developments that have changed Leicester's landscape. And now, for the first time in its history, we have been granted an opportunity to explore the valuable and overlooked history of this cherished establishment and see what it still has to offer to its multicultural community and how to save it from being another abandoned landmark left aside to wash away its decades of history, opportunity and service. This is the extraordinary story of St Peter's Church. Well, uh, St Peter's Church was built in the 1870s, so well over 100 years old. And uh, it was built at a time when there was a big Christian uh, congregation in this area. Uh, it was very interesting that uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s, uh, the West Indian community that came over to the UK uh, found a, a home here that uh, 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 this church made uh, the, those people very, very welcome. I came to Leicester on July the 1st, 1960. I came to Leicester in 1963. I came to Leicester in 1959. I arrived in Leicester 18 December 1970. A very dark, gloomy day. It was snowing from Heathrow. Coming back here, I came to England to join my late husband after getting married to him. It, it was difficult because um, first was that accommodation. The accommodation was appalling. Um, we couldn't get a flat. It's like having a room and that one room has got everything in it because <laughs> we had to share the kitchen, toilet, bathroom, everything. and. Um, it's like your little worldly possession was into a cardboard box. It was an old Victorian building, third floor on the top. No heating, no carpets, and it was freezing cold coming from India, you know. I didn't even bring my woolen clothes to see there. Many people of that generation suffered quite a lot of racism because of the colour of their skin, because of their background. And yet people in the Caribbean, like so many people from uh, overseas, who saw themselves very much as British, and as loyal to, to the motherland, as it were, um, suffered a lot of abuse. And you, you'll have heard from some of the elders the painful experiences of being turned away um, because of their, of their background. And the name calls and all sorts. You could, you could find jobs, but poorly paid. And it was difficult. I used to cry like a child because I missed my parent and, you know, my brother and sisters. Well, I, I, I suppose when people first started arriving uh, in significant numbers from the Caribbean, um, they quite often found that the Church of England uh, was not always welcoming to them. Went to work, when I returned from work, she said, um, what sort of church have you got here? So I said, what are you on about? She said, I went to church, not St. Peter's Church, the church before St. Peter's Church. I got to the door, and this white man was at the door, and the man turned to her and he said to her, um, you're at the wrong place. She turned to him and asked, well, why am I at the wrong place? This is a church. And I think a lot of people experience that. Um, Perhaps St. Peter's was the exception. St. Peter's was the place where the people from those Caribbean communities who had been brought up as lifelong Anglicans uh, felt that they belonged to the Anglican Church. I think of past priests who have you know, brought the community together, making 
more social activities and that sort of thing. Over the years, St. Peter's has seen a dramatic change in circumstances and leaders. When Leicester saw the big arrival of Afro-Caribbeans arriving in the 1960s, Vicar E.W. Carlyle has often been referred to as the beacon of hope and reassurance presented to the straddling migrants that arrived from distant shores, initially accepting them into the area and urging them to integrate into a strong white community amongst racially segregated times. He, I think, was a key person as the parish priest in this parish at that time in terms of helping people not only being made welcome on a Sunday morning, but also I know from some of the stories I have heard of helping people fill in their forms or find work or find accommodation. So eventually I turned up at St. Peter's and they were welcome with open arms, you know. Didn't have the troubles at all at St. Peter's. I can't remember the very first time I came, but because I was just living around the corner, well, it's the nearest church. So I decided, right, I'll go to church on Sunday. And um, it was Father Carly. Yeah, I remember him, yeah. He was at the door and he shook my hand. He said, welcome, and I had the kids with me. And as children, children run all over the place, isn't it? And nobody complained, you know, shh. <laughs> and he, he, he seems to open up the church for West Indian people. And, you know, the 60s and early 70s, the church was blooming. There used to be a West Indian wedding every Saturday here at this church. In the case of St. Peter's, they were given a welcome, and that's why uh, three or four decades later, uh, they feel that that's the place they really belong to. Looking at Highfields today, it is astonishing to see the waves of changes it has undergone over the past 140 years, with a population of just over 17,000. Delving back into the 1850s, Highfields was sparse, practically empty land, with very few houses and no strong community. With the development of the train line, Highfields soon became an area of steady construction and not much time passed before a church was required to accommodate the strong Christian residents within the area. With the death of Earl Howe, an important member of the Church Extension Associate, the organisation raised funds to build St Peter's Church as a memorial and as a result, £13,000 was spent on the construction of the building, an exceptional amount of money at the time. The church thrived throughout the early years, progressing into the 20th century where over 800 people used to regularly attend functions such as the Sunday evening service. World War I struck, and although there was no damage to the church or the surrounding area, many lives were lost and as a result, a memorial was created and the chapel was enlarged in remembrance of those who tragically passed away. So this is the chapel. This wasn't originally a chapel, but by the beginning of the 20th century, the church decided it wanted a chapel uh, for the, the weekday services when the number of people attending was, was quite small. So it, it, it made this area into a chapel. Shortly afterwards, the, there was the First World War, um, when large numbers of people locally were, were killed. So the chapel was enlarged and beautified and made as a war memorial. So you can see here all of the names of the people who were killed in the First World War. After picking up the pieces from the war, the church stood still, only to be struck by World War II. On the 19th of November, 1940, Leicester was victim to a series of heavy bomb strikes killing 72 people in Highfields alone. 
the area opposite the church, which is now Spark and Hope Primary School, was obliterated, and shrapnel pierced into the structure of the church, breaking some of the beautifully drawn stained glass windows, along with other peripheral damage to the exterior of the building. Before we go into the main body of the church, it's worth turning around and looking at the, the west window. Um, my favourite window, I think, because of the, the brightness of the colours. And it's a much more modern window than uh, most of the others. Uh, it was dedicated in 1949. The original window, window having been blown out by the bomb in 1940. So they were looking to replace it. Uh, and they chose Veronica Wall as the artist. And you can see the result. Um, she and her father were, were well-known arts and crafts movement stained glass artists. And she's produced here something quite unusual. And in particular, um, if you look at the uh, mothers and children of all different races that, that, that are gathered round the Virgin Mary, um, so an unusual subject, and that's led many people to feel that the window was later, after Highfield, to become a multicultural community. But in actual fact, it was before that, 1949. So in a sense, it, it, it was almost prophetic. Managing to survive the wreckage of both world wars, the church once again began to pick up the pieces during the 1940s, where Canon Tubby Eaton settled as the vicar. Leading into the 1960s, with the development of various terrace houses, which became a prominent area in which the Afro-Caribbeans started to settle. The church has continued to serve its community since the 1960s, but has now become run down and underdeveloped. We think it's important that there is a place of worship, a sacred space, uh, a spiritual home for the Afro-Caribbean people here in Highfields. It is unique in the way because um, the community, the people, the services, the building, it makes it unique to me. It's the first church that I've been to in Leicester. So it means a lot. And like you, like you said, there's, there's lots of uh, West Indian that moves away from this area. You know, and they still come back. Yeah, of course, if you walk around that part of the city, um, you can't miss uh, the synagogue, which is um, just a, a stone's throw away. Uh, you can't miss the central mosque. Uh, you can't miss the um, buildings which demonstrate very visibly uh, the way in which this has been a focus for migration for a very long time. We have a very meaningful working relationship with each other and we do a lot of work for the communities in the area and uh, we have been the service providers of the area together. I think this is the challenge for St Peter's to reach out to people who don't have deep roots here, who perhaps feel marginalised or um, vulnerable and to demonstrate that whether or not they are Christians there is a place of welcome for them uh, at St Peter's. Um, and I think that's what St Peter's has tried to do at its best. The community within Highfields now accommodates a larger and more diverse range of religions and as a result has overshadowed St Peter's over time with the construction of new buildings and establishments such as the attractive mosques and community centres. As a result, a new project has been initiated to help draw between four to five million pounds to restore St. Peter's back to the glory that it held in the 19th and 20th centuries and to improve its facilities and appearance for various uses in the years to come. I think they've recognised that uh, there's a challenge now to reopen the space that was the church, to use it more creatively and at the same time to look at the associated halls and the associated buildings 
to see how they can help complement a wide range of activities that reflect what is needed and what is possible in the 21st century, rather than obviously where they have their roots in the 19th century and where they had so much development in the 20th century. It's very easy for a community that's felt under threat to withdraw into itself and I think the Caribbean community here have um, sustained this church and made it possible for us to consider uh, doing this big development project. This is a very good idea. It's a two-way system. Uh, it provides facility to the people who live around the church and uh, it creates relationship between the church and the neighborhood and at the same time it also brings support for the church. The church itself is going to be an important place of worship, not just for the existing congregation, but we'd like to build the congregation in this area, um, and also uh, a, a place of hospitality, a place of uh, interfaith um, dialogue and action, uh, a place of learning, but most importantly, a place of living heritage. The quality of the building has been obscured by a lot of the changes that have been made over the years. So it no longer has um, the attraction that it originally had when it was built. Um, much of it needs renovating. I think many of the um, adaptations need stripping out so that we can see the quality of the original building. Um, the structure is great. It just needs um, repair it. Um, when we get some money, get the roof sorted out, then the inside, um, when it's all painted up and such, you know, the right colours to make it more welcoming, I'm quite sure um, lots of folks that sort of live out, um, they will return because the church is different. I was telling them that for the last 40 years, your outside ground, they're still uneven as they were 40 years ago. So when it is done, you know, so obviously it attracts more people and there are so many new, more new communities which are settled on that area. We've got Eastern Europeans, Roma community. So when the doors are open, when they're hospitable, when they're welcoming, so people, diverse communities, they like to come through that. In the traditional church settings, we go back many, many years, was uh, seen as a place of worship and it still is a place of worship. But over time we have, and suddenly the churches have reinvented themselves. They've created the space knowing that there are social needs in a particular set uh, of communities. And what do we do with those needs that the communities has? And we have the building. And what is the point of having a building only used maybe on a Sunday, you know, for two or three hours when the rest of the week uh, it lies empty. So by opening up that space and making it a public space, but more importantly, a safe space. Keep the church as it is, but open it up. Um, it'll still remain a place of worship, and it's really important, but it will be able to be used for other purposes like concerts, banquets. More activities would, would get the children to come back. If we had something that, you know, more activities, things like games and things that kids like, I think they would come back. So it is crucial for uh, community relations in the area. It's going to be a wonderful meeting place. It will be a, a, a place that uh, if you have weddings and funerals and uh, other big uh, uh, events, that will, people will want to come. It will be a place that no, nowhere else in the city is like this. In most urban areas of England, urban church buildings have had to change and St Peter's Highfields has to learn to do that too. One of the challenges will be how we relate to the uh, new and uh, strong Muslim communities that now surround us, the uh, multiplicity of mosques and uh, within the Islamic tradition, the wide spectrum of beliefs, just as there is within the spectrum of Christianity, and how to establish a sense of good neighbours and of, of, of common good I think the benefits are, 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 are num numerous, I think, anyway. Uh, I think the benefits are, you know, basically understanding of each other. Mm. And that's continued to develop because Leicester is a diverse city and we can't sit on our uh, laurels and say everything's good about our city because there are challenges. And once we have relationships developed, 
then we have an understanding of each other. A lot of people, the congregation start deteriorating because a lot of people are saying the church is cold, you know, and so But then we had this bloke who left a legacy for us, I think of 20 something thousand pounds. And he specifically said it was to put heating in St. Peter's Church. And that's how we got the heat in there, St. Peter's Church today. This will be expensive. You can't change these kind of buildings in the, and preserve the quality that you need and ensure that they'll be there for another uh, two or three generations without spending a lot of money. And I think sometimes because of the condition of the church, I think that's why some folks will say, oh, um, St. Peter's Church is run down, um, those sort of things. What we're trying to do is get it back as near as possible to the, to the beauty uh, when it was built. A few decades ago now, I think the church uh, realised that with the changing uh, patterns of the community and the patterns of worship and the numbers coming, uh, the change was, was necessary. And they accommodated it at the time by putting a division in the middle of the church. As we come in at the west door is probably the best view of the church as a whole. Uh, and you can see going straight down to what was originally the high altar at the east end uh, with the six large stained glass windows around it. You can also see the, the, the width of the building um, and originally it would have seated 850 people. As the congregations were dwindling uh, it was decided um, to divide the main body of the church so you see here, there's a glass screen dividing the, the back of the church, which could be used as a community hall, uh, and the other side of it, which remained as a, as a, as a church. So uh, halfway down the middle of the church, there's a screen that uh, will need to go and, uh, um, so that the whole beauty, the simple lines of the church can be opened up again. What was originally intended to be a helpful development has now become a hindrance to the good use of the building. We want to uh, obviously uh, uh, get the outside of the church done. It's very um, untidy and we'll have a new piazza as an entrance to the church so it becomes what it should be, a wonderful building uh, in Highfields that's uh, visible. And also the building needs to be made to be flexible so that it can be used both for worship but also for other things uh, during the week. So that the place is fully used and uh, the community also feels a sense of ownership of the building. We, we can't any longer afford to keep very large, expensive buildings standing empty for six days a week and just used on Sundays. You know, at the end of the day, if you don't if, you're not, if you don't like a certain place, then you'll move away from that particular establishment and therefore naturally will close. But I think that the secret of the church is, is ever developing and that's what, what is so good about this initiative. And this adaption itself of different ways that we are living in and the, the centuries that are moving on is, I think, a credit to the organisation to say that they have reinvented it, they have rethought about it and said, how can we have a role to play, a purpose and have a presence in a community that goes beyond just serving the Christian community and for that I would say that is an enormous asset to the community. The expansion of the building and I, and I think it's quite key that as a ward councillor for the area that we support this initiative because I think the churches have a long history uh, in Highfields and supporting uh, people from other countries that have come over here. We have to actually believe in the work that you are doing, that you are creating a difference in the society where you live in. It's positive, um, the, the development is endless, and, and I think that with the, with the money itself, it can open up opportunities. And you know, the church has, has a major role to play in a part um, in our communities. It would be a, a tragedy, I think, if St Peter's were to close or to stand empty for years because um, because it hasn't been possible to develop the building for a, for a future use. And I think it's really exciting that they're facing up to these new challenges, recognising, of course, that there's a long way to go. There's quite a lot of problems to be, to be sorted, but their vision 
to return the church and to renew the church uh, as a central part of the local community is enormously exciting and I really have tremendous admiration for the vision that they're showing and the determination that they've got. So I think this vision is vital for the future, not only of St Peter's, but for the whole of that community. And I think St Peter's has shown that it can build bridges between faiths, between different parts of the community, and that when there was a real crisis with people um, who, who died violent deaths in September of this year, it was to St Peter's that many people came from different faiths uh, to to express their sadness and to make their prayers. So for all those reasons, I believe we should be investing in St Peter's for the future. If you could say a hidden jewel in, in Highfields, uh, people see it, but they've probably stopped taking any notice of it. It's a really important Victorian building for this area. Uh, and if we, uh, if we keep it as a church is what the plan is, then it's an important heritage in terms of the Christian faith in a multi-faith area. To me, these sort of historical buildings, we shouldn't forget them because they have been the part Leicester is known for being a place of diversity, for being passionate about being one city with many different cultures and traditions and this project I hope will, will uh, echo that theme. So I think it's not just a city that we live in, we work in and raise our children. We owe something to the citizens of this great city we live in and especially our immediate area. And for all those living within the Highfields area uh, need to learn to work with each other and support each other. It's okay to talk about community cohesion, but I'd like to see the average person on the street actually talking about a project or projects that can help gel and cement the community together. That, I think, has tremendous potential to change, to adapt, while remaining true to the ideals of those who founded it, to change and adapt in a way that enables it to continue to serve the communities of Highfields in the next century in the way that it has in the last century and a half. For everyone working on the project and for the whole community, this initiative is essential in preserving a piece of living heritage which has been standing for 139 years. In the 21st century, the strength history and opportunity that the church has offered over countless years has become noticeable to all throughout Leicestershire. It has united different religions, races and cultures, acted as a safe house in times of peril and radically changed the way this community has related to each other as it has brought different walks of life into a new millennia. One can only hope that the church can remain all that it has been and hopes to be for not only our generation, but for many more generations to come.